Today's lecture is supported by the Fogelsong Family Lectureship Fund, Mark A. Fogelsong and Diane M. Hilmer Fogelsong established this endowment fund in 2002 to support the lecture platforms here at Chautauqua. Fogelsongs and their two children have been coming to Chautauqua since 1976. Mark is retired from a career with Eli Lilly. Diane is retired from a career in nursing. Please help me thank the Fogelsong family for their lasting support of Chautauqua. All of this week, we have heard from experts on language, speech, and oratory who have helped us trace the life of the spoken word. With Trevor Cox on Monday, we traced the evolution of the human voice and saw how technology is impacting and even threatening voice identity. From Larry Arne on Tuesday, we heard an impassioned defense of free speech on college campuses and a call for civility in discussion and debate. From Julie Washington on Wednesday, we saw the effects of cultural dialects on public perception and literacy education and learned the importance of code switching to our everyday lives. And from Akila Conopio Crozer yesterday, I got it out, um, we learned of the efforts to preserve and share the critically endangered Hawaiian language with its richness of Hawaiian culture. Joining us today is renowned poet and spoken word artist Joshua Bennett, the Mellon Assistant Professor of English and Creative Writing at Dartmouth College and the author of The Sobbing School, which was a National Poetry Series winner and a finalist for an NAACP Image Award. Professor Bennett has recited his original works at venues such as Sundance Film Festival, NAACP Image Awards, the Clinton Global Citizen Awards, and President Barack Obama's Evening of Poetry and Music at the White House. He holds a PhD in English from Princeton University and a master's degree in theater and performance studies from the University of Warwick, where he was a Marshall Scholar. In 2010, he delivered the commencement address at the University of Pennsylvania, from which he graduated with distinctions of Phi Beta Kappa and Magna Cum Laude. Pro <laughs> Professor Bennett has received five more degrees and he'll have all eight Ivy League schools. Professor Bennett has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Ford Foundation, MIT, and the Society of Fellows at Harvard University. His forthcoming books include Being Property Once Myself, Blackness and the End of Man, his second collection of poetry, Ode, and his first work of narrative nonfiction, Spoken World, A Cultural History. We are very honored to host him today on this, his first visit to Chautauqua. So please join me in offering a warm Chautauqua welcome to Joshua Bennett. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. And you all for your enthusiasm. Whenever I'm up this early, it's because I'm lecturing for a group of 53 undergrads. So this is <laughs> beautiful and picturesque in so many ways. So I had about three or four different versions of a formal lecture for this. And then I realized that it might make a bit more sense to actually show you spoken word as opposed to simply talking at you about it. Great, okay. So that's something that resonates with folks. And so I'm gonna take you on a bit of a journey today, uh, not just through my life as a spoken word artist, but also my life as an educator, uh, which did not begin uh, in formal institutions like the several that were just listed, but actually in middle schools, uh, in cafeterias in the South Bronx, uh, in prisons, uh, and in my parents' dining room, where as a four-year-old boy, I would improvise sermons after church for 40 minutes at a time uh, in my family and all their kindness would listen. Uh, and, and that taught me something. 
you know, as a very small boy, which was that words had power. Uh, and whatever the power was that on Baptist, you know, Sunday mornings would have people cartwheeling and running and laughing and crying, I knew that I wanted that. Uh, and the spoken word became part of my way of capturing it. So this first poem is a poem I wrote for my first ever class. It was a group of nine-year-olds. There were nine of them, eight girls, uh, and one boy named Hamilton. The Broadway show wasn't out yet, so we didn't have jokes on him about it. He was a great kid. They were all great. Uh, and I wrote them this poem in the summer of 2012. Uh, and it's entitled, Say It, Sing It If the Spirit Leads. Say it, that every single day is a toast to living, an ode to the way we make survival an art. My classroom is a self-love anthem in nine parts. Together, we unlearn shame, we dream silly, we sing what we cannot say anywhere else, so say it. Say, I am 12 years old and my joy is stainless. The next time the world calls me subhuman, I will remind it that spell check is a virtue. Say, I think the word you're looking for is subterranean. 10,000 leagues too deep for easy definitions, fleet as the feet of those Harriet Tubman kept close as kin, so yes. We do start every single day like this, like poetry gives us a new grammar for our bodies. Say it. I exist in excess of my anguish. I am not invisible. I'm a beam of light, too brilliant for untrained vision. I am not target practice, not a bullseye with rhythm. This breath is no illegal substance, so sing it, a ballad for the youngest son, how he survives beat cops that see Caesars and seize up scream, freeze hands up to chain his flame, praise the lyric name, Quavangene, Latavia, Debrickashaw, Devante, how they make the mouth a musician, sing it, when you're a seventh grader in Philly and they try to turn your middle school into a ghost town, may your voice be atmospheres imploding, sing it, with conviction say, I'm an Illidel lyricist, metaphors Everest, anybody hating on my halo is irrelevant. I flow like Baldwin, Clifton, Gwendolyn, Zora, Langston, Cullen, Ellison, the authors that offer a glimpse of what heaven is. Say it, say we fly as Zeppelins, heavens high at our heaviest, dignified even when strangers try to make our beauty a burden. Say no one will make my beauty a burden, say no. Do not touch my hair. <laughs> Say, for real, the next time you try, we will have a problem. Say, this skin is no black hole. It is a holy blackness. I cannot shake, say, Harlem shake, say, the appropriation train stops here, say, Lindy Hop and Hip Hop are half sisters. That's why they got the exact same last name. Say, this is the last time you call me out of my name, the last time you call me anything other than what I claimed for myself when I woke up this morning, say no one can co-opt our mourning. We will honor the dead, praise what they left behind. No one can make us afraid of being alive. My people stay liver than live. They always have, say always have say always will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And so long before I wrote that poem, I was an undergraduate at the University of Pennsylvania. And for whatever, oh, we have some Quakers in the house. Okay, shout out. This is great. So what I was not told by any of my mentors at the time is that you have to take a science class to graduate from Penn. So there I was, I was a senior. I had already been admitted to graduate school. I was very excited you know, to be up and out the door. Uh, and here was this requirement staring me in the face. So I, I ran to the registrar's office and I looked through the big blue book. It still wasn't all online then. you know. And I thought, okay, I need to take a science class. And I'm rolling through and I think, I'm gonna take oceanography. Moby Dick is my favorite novel. I grew up in church. You know, Jonah, Noah, those are my guys. Like, I understand the ocean. 
I can totally do this. I'm going to ace it. Life is going to be great. Apparently, and I don't know if we have any oceanographers in the house, oceanography has nothing to do with any of that stuff. <laughs> it's largely about the angle at which light hits water, you know, the darkness at the bottom of the sea, all of that kind of stuff. But what I do remember about my professor uh, is that she told me a blue whale has a heart the size of a car, all right? And now for those of us who are teachers, that's not the most useful metaphor, right? Is this a Humvee? Is it a Prius? Different gas mileage, different species of car, right? But what I knew, even as a 21-year-old who was in serious fear of not graduating, uh, was that I one day wanted to give someone a love that big. So as poets do, I went home that night, I pulled out my notebook, and I wrote this poem. Uh, and it's called Baleanoptera, which is the genus specification for the blue whale. You can Wikipedia that immediately. I didn't make it up, I promise. So this is Baleanoptera. When we are old, hair the color of tombstones, bones that sound like wet windshield wipers whenever we slow dance through the living room, I imagine that I will look you in the eye as if there is something small and precious in prison there and say to you, darling, did you know that a blue whale has a heart the size of a car? <laughs> when you reply correctly, as you always seem to do when I ask you difficult questions about oceanography, I'll probably just laugh, rejoicing over the fact that every time you smile, it makes the wrinkles at the corner of your eyes look like six willow branches, all lifting their heads from prayer in unison, the wind humming a somber hymn beneath its breath, just as our anthem jogs to a close, and I whisper in your ear, how did you know that I was the one? When all of those well-dressed jackals came galloping to your door, begging for the rights to your ring finger, what made you lock the deadbolt on your ribs, looking them squarely in the face and saying with joy, I am keeping all of this beauty for someone I have never even met. Did you ever doubt, ever sit in your dorm room and think that maybe your soulmate had chosen someone a lot more boring but a lot less picky than you and opted for the easy way out of a life filled with love when I was 22 years old? Beard freshly grown, an ocean away from my family with the kind of pain that drives people to do selfish, barely forgivable things. I dreamt of you nightly, hunted for your smile in every audience that I broke for, hoping that I could literally steal a glance, download it onto my retinas and replay the moment our eyes first played freeze tag, and neither one of us wanted to stop being it. So we just kept on touching, hoping that Father Time would give us a hall pass and allow us to orbit one another forever. And speaking of orbits, did you know that there are more stars in the sky than grains of sand on the entire planet and that I would give you either one if you merely asked, peel the night from the sky skin like the rind of an orange, or ask God if I could borrow the breeze for just a moment and blow the shoreline of every beach into a giant hourglass made just for us and say this, this is how long I will adore the things about you that no one else even notices, like your laugh and how it sounds like a mix of Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock and two rainstorms singing perfectly in tune, those orthopedic shoes, and how they always match your cardigans perfectly. <laughs> those crooked glasses, and how they dangle at the edge of your nose like the legs of two lovers on a tire swing the last summer they will ever see each other's face. The first time I saw your face, I thought, wow, if there were a gorgeous Olympics, she would be a lock. And maybe I would be your key. And maybe love is a club that we both got into for free. And we just haven't stopped dancing for all these decades because we really like the music in here. And maybe, if you asked me to, I would crawl through the veins of a blue whale on my hands and knees photograph that Volkswagen-sized heart of hers and place the picture underneath your pillow before you went to sleep. When you ask me about it, I'll probably just laugh, giggling like I've got a handful of diamonds in my throat 
and say, see, I told you, the biggest heartbeat ever made. And now it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, so I have a couple more and then I just wanna have a conversation with you all about so many things. Uh, we can talk about the time I met Beyonce at Soundcheck, which was pretty incredible. Uh, so it was actually at the NAACP Image Awards and I walk in, I had not been warned about uh, Beyonce in advance. So I'm thinking I'm just coming to Soundcheck one of my poems and she's doing her song, Halo. And I kid you not, her hair is blowing behind her, but we're inside the Shrine Auditorium. There's no wind machine. It was just, you know, Beyonce bending physics, you know, as she does. So it's pretty incredible. So we can definitely talk about that in Q&A. Um, yeah, that'll be good. We'll also probably talk about the White House and then I promise I'll read another poem, in part because my mother was my plus one. Um, and I don't know how many of you have been to the South Bronx, but that's where my mother's from. Uh, and we are a boisterous people, right? in the South Bronx. And so my mother sees Michelle Obama across the room, and I kid you not, this was almost a real security issue. She sees her secret service, pushes them out of the way. <laughs> and says, did you see my son? He killed it, right? He gets that from me. I don't get it from her. She's not a poet, all right? <laughs> but she is incredible, uh, and she raised me to believe in my voice uh, and what the power of language could do. Um, and alongside her, I had amazing teachers uh, from the time I was very, very young. And so I wrote a new piece uh, to bring here to you all. Uh, my next book is called Ode, O-W-E-D. Uh, and it's a book of celebration for all the people, places, and things that made me who I am. Uh, and so this is for my 10th grade English teacher, Miss Sims, uh, who actually just transformed my life. You know, I spent most of my childhood in schools uh, that were underfunded, you know, and so by the time I got to this elite private school in Rye, New York, I didn't have a lot of the basic tools I needed to be successful. Uh, Miss Sims saw me, uh, and she saw a ton of potential, and she invested a lot of her time. Um, and so whenever I step in front of my lecture hall uh, at Dartmouth, you know, at this beautiful school um, in Hanover, New Hampshire, I think about her. Uh, and I think about every teacher that saw a kid that didn't have a great shot at the beginning and believed I could be whatever I wanted and told me so to my face and followed through. Uh, so for every one of you, whatever you take from this, if not just, you know, the Beyonce story, make that sort of investment uh, in someone's life if you can, uh, because I promise it'll make all the difference in the world. So this is Ode to the 10th grade English teacher. I was 14 and had just learned what a thesis statement was like a week ago. I was a decade plus in schools too poor to afford books with all the pages intact. And somehow by 10th grade, I was two buses, one train, one mile walk away from an elite academic scholarship funded education, which also meant that for the entire first semester of my freshman year, I was detention every day. I was a 5 a.m. alarm clock each morning and still late for homeroom, friends. I was on the cusp of flunking everything. Conceptual physics, global history, Spanish one, you name it. Each day forgetting what brought me there in the first place and then came you. Then came Morrison and Chaucer and Shakespeare and Baldwin in the same breath. Then came comments on my report card saying things like, Joshua Bennett is a witty elocutionist. And I had no idea what that last word meant. <laughs> so I looked it up because that's what my mother made me do whenever I was faced with the unfamiliar. And of course, you were not my mother but you were fashioned from the same starshine fabric as she and you wore your historical brilliance that way. Miss Sims, first of her name, 
breaker of generational curses and systemic self-doubt, lover of Motown, advocate for boys and girls hailing from the underground of this world of access and wealth, those of us who were not supposed to be anywhere near the great American canon, Latin and Greek, close reading 19th century text with postmodern technique, race, gender, class, no longer cast as secondary concerns, who we were inside and out was now the subject at hand, was central to the discussion and altogether sacred text, this skin, this hair, this crescendo in our chest, this story in the flesh we held that the world despised, but you called holy. And this made all the difference is what I keep trying to say to anyone who will listen. This one woman bellowing back to an entire history made to make us let go of our slang, our faith, our mind in moments of doubt or fear. This prophet stood, this shimmering shield saying brilliant saying creative, saying this draft is good, but the next one will be fantastic, saying to be a writer, you have to be a reader first, and no, you did not have to teach us that books are time machines. We knew that already. We knew every vocab word you taught us was a single brick in a dream so big we could hide everyone we loved inside of it. We knew that we would never have to be alone again, that we were shining points in a cloud of witnesses with names nothing like our own, sharing our journey across the ages, and it was you who opened the door, who unbolted the window in our minds and let the Blue Jays in. In spite of it all, you dared to call us possible, and so we were, and so we took to the air and lived. Thank you. Thank you all so much. All right, so I have two more poems, and then we're just going to hang out. And one of them is about my dad, who's my favorite person, in part because he's so intense. Like one time, he's a Marine, and so we were locked out of our house. I don't know how that ties to this story. Well, I guess his intense athleticism. So we got locked out of the house, and my father scaled the side of our house, broke into the bathroom window, and casually opened the front door. <laughs> Which is why I became a poet. I could just couldn't become an athlete after that. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> that there were just these large-scale feats being performed in front of me for so long uh, that I had to switch it up, you know? <laughs> I had to do something different. Um, so this poem is actually tied to that too, um, and it's tied to high school in particular for me uh, and my process of becoming an educator. So when I first graduated from Princeton and I got out into the world, I was shocked at how often uh, people use the language of diversity and inclusion to not see each other. It seemed to me like the strangest thing. So, no, I'm serious. It was very odd. and so. I would go for you know, a job talk or a, you know, a lecture and people would say, oh, are you the new diversity hire? And I'd say, no, I'm Joshua, actually. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm here to talk to you all about American literature and you know, I have a book out. Like they didn't just find me on the street. You know? They're like, oh, there is a very dashing young African-American man. Let's bring him in here to teach our students that pay $60,000 a year. I mean, it just doesn't work like that, right? Um, and so I realized that there were just all this shorthand that people had inherited to just talk about human difference, to talk about all the incredible different ways we show up in the world, right, in our individual ways. And uh, so I, I wrote this poem, um, and it's called Token Sings the Blues. Uh, and it's for anyone that's ever had part of your identity used to flatten you, um, rather than just as one facet, you know, of who you are, which is a human being in history, just trying to figure it out, you know, um, and take care of somebody, including yourself. So this is Token Sings the Blues. I see you. You always are almost always only one in the room. Yeah, maybe two, 
Three is a crowd. Three is, wow, there's so many of you. Three will get you confused with people that look nothing like you. You get called Devin or Sheila. (laughs) Your name isn't Devin or Sheila. You do your best not to ignore such casual erasure. You know silence will be taken as affirmation, praise even, and you're always affirmative. You're an affirmative action, action figure. You, fantastic, first black friend. You, first ballot, quota keeper. You almost cry when your history professor says, you know, in this country, the gold standard used to be people. Funny how no one comes right out and says things like, you people anymore. It's all code words like thug or diversity hire. You, diversity all by yourself. You contain multitudes and are yet contained everywhere you go, confined, like there's always someone watching you and isn't there. And isn't that the entire point of this flesh you inherited? This unrepentant stain. Be twice as good, your mother says, as if what anyone else has is worth your panic, worth measuring your very life against, and you always remember to measure your hair, your volume, your tone over email. You perpetually sorry. You don't know why. You apologize to no one in particular just for being around and in your body at the same time. They tell you your body is the real problem. You monster, you beast of burden, you beast and burden, you horse but human, you centaur, you map the stars and pull back your bow to shoot the moon and it's one good white eye. You are enough. You are brilliant, you are beautiful, you are everything, your big sister says. And on your best days above ground, you believe her. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. All right, so we're going to close here with a poem about my dad. Okay, what else do y'all need to know? I told you the story about him climbing the house. I don't know. He just, he did what he could, you know? And I think it's so important, especially in, in our cultural moment, to celebrate that in each other, not perfection, not someone that never makes mistakes or says the wrong thing, but someone who does what they can and shows up right? Not just rhetorically, doesn't say the right things all the time, but is there for you when you need them. So my father is 70 years old. Uh, He was born in rural Alabama, grew up eating Red River clay. Does anyone know where Red River clay is? It is what it sounds like, which blew my mind. I used to complain about Burger King. This man was eating clay. Do you hear what I'm saying? And he worked at the post office for 40 years. Uh, And whenever he would drop me at my high school, the one you heard about earlier, he would say, I go to that job every day so you can have choices. He would lift a hundred pound bag of mail every night, over and over, from truck to conveyor belt to put food on the table for his family and so that his son can make a life reading poems, right? It's almost unfathomable to me now. the selflessness and the vision, right? To see what my father has seen from American history, I'm an impossibility, you know? Me and my big sister with her degree in computer science and my little brother who loves drumming and jazz and walking around in a bathrobe. Is anyone here an older sibling by any chance? Any older siblings? Okay, so the most difficult thing for me about being an older sibling is seeing everything your younger siblings get away with that you never would have gotten away with, right? So my little brother had this whole phase where everything was done in a bathrobe, right? He would just come home, put his arms out, it's bathrobe time, right? He gets donned in his bathrobe, eats chicken nuggets in his bathrobe, watches Nickelodeon in his bathrobe, plays the drums in his bathrobe, all right? And my parents allowed this. If I had done this, I would have been bringing shame on our household, you know? (laughs) And been told to get back to my physics homework. 
which was good advice because I was really having a rough time with physics uh, as a freshman. But my dad made space for all of that, right? With his very complicated upbringing, with his nine brothers and sisters, he loved us, you know, with all of himself. And so I wrote this poem for him. It's called America Will Be after Langston Hughes. And it's inspired in part by the fact that my father integrated his high school in Alabama when he was 17 years old. Uh, and whenever I ask him about it, and this is, it's the same with the war, he never makes himself a hero, you know, which to me is the ultimate sign of character. <laughs> if you talk to someone about their life and they're not the hero of their own narrative, right? So I ask him, what was that like, dad? And he always just says it was lonely, you know? He doesn't talk about being frightened. He doesn't talk about the full weight of history on his back. He talks about sitting alone for lunch, right? And he also talks about reading Chaucer, which wasn't fun, right? Those are the two things that he talks about. And so I wrote this to celebrate him and his incredible optimism, right? Not just about what the country is, but what it can be, right? My father believes in the future. Right, he always has. And so I want to celebrate him and I want to talk to you all. Thank you, by the way. If you can give a round of applause for yourselves for being an amazing audience. You've been incredible. So this is America Will Be after Langston Hughes. I am now at the age where my father calls me brother when we say goodbye. Take care of yourself brother. He whispers a half beat before we hang up the phone, and it is as if some great bridge has unfolded over the air between us. He is 70 years old. He was born in the throat of Jim Crow, Alabama, one of 10 children, their bodies side by side in the kitchen each morning, like a pair of hands exalting. Over breakfast, I ask him to tell me the hardest thing about going to school back then, expecting a history I have already memorized. Boycotts and attack dogs, fire hoses, Bull Connor in his personal tank, candy paint shining white as a Confederate ghost. He says, honestly, probably having to read the Canterbury Tales. <laughs> he says, eating lunch alone. These days, I hear the word America and think first of my father's loneliness, of the hands holding pens that stabbed him as he walked through the hallway, unclenched palms settling onto a wooden desk, taking notes, trying to pretend the shame didn't feel like an inheritance. You say democracy. And I see men holding documents that sent him off to war a year later, Motown blaring from a country boy's bunker as napalm scarred the sky into jigsaw patterns, his eyes open wide as the blooming blue heart of the light bulb in a Crown Heights basement where he and my mother will dance for the first time, their bodies swinging like rockets in the impossible dark. And yes, I know, this is more than likely not what you mean when you sing liberty, but it is the only kind I know or can readily claim. The times where those hunted by history are underground and somehow still daring to love what they cannot hold or fully fathom when a stranger is not a threat but the promise of a different ending. I woke up this morning and there were men on television lauding a wall big enough to box out an entire world. Families torn with the stroke of a pen, citizenship little more than some garment that can be stolen or reduced to cinder at a tyrant's whim. My father knows this, grew up knowing this, witnessed firsthand the fire bombs, the clan, multiple messiahs, love soaked and shot through, somehow still believes in this grand blood-stained experiment, still votes, still prays that his children might make a life unlike anything he has ever seen. He he looks at me like the promise of another cosmos. And I never know what to tell him. All of the books in my head have made me cynical and distant, but there's a choir in him that calls me forward. My disbelief, built as it is from the bricks of his belief, 
Not in any America you might see or network news or hear heralded before the start of a football game, but in the quiet power of Sam Cooke singing, he was born by a river that remains unnamed, that he runs alongside to this day, some vast and future country, some nation within a nation, black as candor, loud as the sound of my father's unfettered laughter over cheese eggs and coffee, his eyes shut tight as armories, his fists finally unclenched as if he were invincible. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Oh, wow. Wow, thank you. Wow. So let's have that conversation, and I hope you'll all join me. Our ushers will uh, be collecting your questions. You may also uh, submit them via Twitter. Um, hashtag somewhere, CHQ2019. <laughs> you think I'd know that, but the technology thing and I are, hmm, so. Um, so this is a week on the life of the spoken word. Yes. And as you were reading your poems, I was wondering how much it mattered that we heard you speak them as opposed to reading them off of the written page. Yeah. No, I mean, it makes all the difference in the world, I think. Uh, oh, thank you. This is so great. I need to bring you all back with me to Dartmouth. If my colleagues could hear this, you know. <laughs> be fantastic. I'm sorry? Yeah, fair enough. It's a good school. <laughs> I've had a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, so every poem I write, I want it to feel like a conversation, you know? I want it to feel as lively and as intimate and as personal as if you were just sitting down with me at a lunch, maybe a bit more intense than that. But I also wanted to have the music of those first preachers I heard. You know, my father was also a deacon. And I just remember hearing him pray or hearing people say that something they heard in church that day was their word for the week, is the phrase they used, and that they would carry it with them to sustain them. Um, and so to me, it matters that you see a flesh and blood person before you because it's, a, it's almost a, a reminder of what's possible. Right? This is ancient, what we're doing here. This is the older tradition in the Western world, this oral poetry, the Odyssey, the Iliad. Right? These ancient Greek poems were taught in school. They began as performances. Um, and I don't think we've ever lost that, um, but I think we need to recover that memory. And so part of what I'm doing in my performances is attempting that, right? is saying that it's important for people to encounter one another through something uh, like spoken word, because I think there's nothing like it in the world. You know, um, which is part of why there are poetry slams everywhere. There are poetry slams in Germany with a thousand people. I got asked to judge a poetry slam in, uh, in Delhi, India recently. It's like, who's watching my YouTube videos out there? Someone, apparently. And that's incredible, <laughs> you know, that a kid from Yonkers, New York, uh, could have a camera phone video uploaded onto the internet. It could go viral on Facebook. And for the next 10 years, I would tour the world, you know, with these poems I wrote in my notebook my mother got me from the 99 cent store. You know, I think that's, that's only possible in this tradition. And so I'm thankful every day for it. Thank you. Who or what are your spoken word inspirations? Mm. How does your art fit into the spectrum of oratory and the spoken word? This is fantastic. Are these Twitter questions? Or are you just generating these? Um, I don't know where this one came from. <laughs> okay. out, th out there somewhere. Oh, this is fantastic. People are just formulating on the fly. In the tradition, man, my spoken word inspirations. I have so many. Uh, Sonny Patterson, uh, Amiri Baraka, for sure. Uh, Gwendolyn Brooks. 
um, as someone, not just as a, an orator and writer, but as someone who believed that her poems could go anywhere, you know? So she was a Pulitzer Prize winner that would teach poetry workshops uh, in the basement of a church, you know? So she's an inspiration to me uh, to take the poems wherever people are. My mother, uh, her rhetorical power when she tells you to go clean the bathroom <laughs> is, it's singular, you know? It just, I was like, absolutely, I need that. Whatever, whatever that is. Uh, Otis Moss the <laughs> third. Yeah. You know? It's absolutely incredible. And I remember the first time he invited me to Trinity and I, I met his, his son and we had a great time. And so yeah, that all of those disparate voices together uh, are my inspiration. Has Miss Sims seen your poem? No, the, you're the first people in the history of the world to hear that poem. I had never read it aloud before today. Um, so I'll probably email it to her, I think. This was recorded, yes, so I'll email oh, <laughs> Thanks. Yes. I feel like that's probably a teacher that's like, let your teachers know, give them their roses. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you talk about your students today? Oh what goodness, differences yeah. do you observe about the experiences they've had to that mm. point in their lives compared with yours at that same point? Oh my goodness. Well, the internet, for one. The fear that uh, things they say in class or uh, in a Facebook post will follow them for the rest of their lives and they'll never be able to live it down. Um, so my students are incredibly cautious. They're incredibly judicious about the things they say. And on one level, I understand it. You know, they don't want to do harm. They don't want to take up too much space in class. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm like, you paid a lot of money to be in my class. So if you want to talk, you should talk. You know, uh, we have to be uh, courageous with our speech and we have to take care of each other. And we have to forgive each other too, as a fundamental principle, you know. Um, I was, thank you. You know, I was away from the church for a long time, but what I could never relinquish was this basic principle of mercy. It sort of blew my mind, right? Because mercy is the goodness you don't deserve, right? But then I realized that mercy holds the world together, right? That every day we breathe is, is a mercy in so many ways, and that when we show mercy to, to each other, things can change. So one, my students are more cautious um, than I was. They're better read. I mean, they, they really read everything. I mean, in college, I was doing a lot of things. I was jumping on couches at house parties. I mean, I don't know that I was reading sort of dense critical theory and poetry the way my students do when I assign it. So shout out to them, they're great. What else? I believed, as they do, uh, that I could change the world, but my students, they give almost every minute of their day to trying to make this world a better place, whether that's thinking about race and gender justice, whether it's thinking about the environment, whether it's thinking about the ways that engineering can be a social good. I mean, this is what they want to talk about in office hours, right? <laughs> College students are, I think, really misrepresented right now in the public sphere. In office hours, my students have questions about their moral compass. How can I be a decent person? And how can books help me do that? They don't ask me about their GPAs. They want to make the world better. And that's what the university is supposed to be for. Right? And so those young people inspire me every day uh, in that way and in countless others. Yeah. How do you write? Do you rewrite? Mm -hmm. Use of dictionaries, rhyming dictionaries, yeah. thesauruses? It's a great question. How do I write? With fear and trembling, you know? Like, <laughs> just in my room, terrified. No, I mean, look, one of my favorite poets and critics, a guy named Fred Moten, once said, I'm just trying to make music out of stuff I heard people say. Um, and I think that's my process. You know, if I'm on the bus or the train, if I'm at this beautiful place with you all, I'm always just trying to listen. You know, I always have a, a notepad or a phone with me. Uh, so I can record the music of the everyday. I almost always start with a sound or with a story, right, before anything else. The first line of that poem about my dad, it really did just come from a conversation where he said, all right, take care of yourself, brother, and then hung up the phone. I was like, brother? 
is this what 30 is, that I'm my dad's brother now? You know, that just seemed so impossible to me. Um, but I think it was his way of saying that like our bond is both unchanged and um, fundamentally advanced now. Like you're my son, but we're also here. You know, you're my comrade too. We're in solidarity and I love you, you know? Um, and I'm glad you're here with me that you made it this far. So my process is just trying to gather those stories and tell the truth. Um, I want to represent not just places and people that have been underrepresented in American literature, um, but not represented at all. Like, I, I want to write poems about my big sister's hoop earrings and how, you know, growing up, all the salmon we ate was out of a can, so I didn't know what an actual salmon looked like until I was 25. And I think that's super interesting because I, I think people hear my bio and they assume things about my life. I'm like, dude, I didn't see a salmon. I didn't know, did I even know? I knew it was a fish, but maybe I thought all fish were in cans. It's unclear, right? <laughs> but I wanna write poems about that, right? And I want them to be published all over. And I wanna say that, you know, we have a world, you know? Poor people have a world, working people have a world. Um, and it has its own aesthetics, its own principles, its own ethics. And we have to write those things, you know? We have to sing them to the world. And it'll be received, I think, um, if we do it with honesty and rigor and beauty. Uh, I have two questions, one from Twitter that, and one from the audience here um, that uh, I think try to get at the same thing. Yeah. Um, how do you distinguish between poetry and prose, or what makes poetry poetry? Mm. Oh goodness, what makes poetry? These are ancient <laughs> first questions. Okay. All right, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna stop quoting people after this. I mean, I think Ann Carson has it right, though, that maybe like prose is a house, and poetry is a man on fire running through that house. Right? Um, so, there's something about, you know, the structure of prose, the sentence as a unit of meaning that can take place in poems. Like, there are poems that look like paragraphs, uh, and there are poems that are a bunch of semicolons across the page, and you have to look and say, well, how do you read that? Right? How do you share that? Um, but the, the Greek root of poetry is poesis. It's a making, right? So meaning is something we're making together with poetry. Um, and I really do believe we're making new worlds out of language whenever we write or read poetry together, right? So I don't always know how to define poetry in a formal sense, but I feel like when I hear something or feel it, it's a poem and it can be a song it really can be a, a tree or a room full of strangers that somehow come together and do this. That's not just poetic for me, that's a poem. That is this individual congregation of lines, you know, that I'll always remember. I'll remember it the way I remember a poem and it'll feed my thinking that way. Um, so I try, I have formal distinctions between poetry and prose, but for me, I just try to write it out in whatever format the muse will give it to me, you know? I'm so thankful when I can even get something out that's not an email these days, right? That I try not to harp on whether it's, it's poetry or prose, right? I would say whatever makes you feel most free, you know? But always read poetry if you're a prose writer, I would say. It'll free up the language a little bit. At least it does that for me. When I feel the essay is getting dry, I have to read a good poem. Uh, it makes me adventurous. It makes me daring. It makes me unafraid um, of what language makes possible. The questioner writes, I am a book designer at a university press. Okay. What do you hope or expect to see when your poems are set on a page? Uh, I mean, I guess I hope they look like the PDF I sent over. That would be the first thing. <laughs> you know. That would definitely be my primary concern, you know. I'd hope that they were my poems. Oh, who's this poem's good, but I don't, I don't think it's, it's mine, you know. Um, I mean, I'm definitely open to playing with the shape of poems and how they look and to working with designers and editors that are adventurous in that way. Um, I think maybe by the third book, we'll have some stuff like that. I mean, in my first book, I have, hmm, it's a poem in the shape of like a cockroach, and it's about cockroaches, but 
That's really it. That's as risky as I get, you know? <laughs> Nothing else. So please tell that person to tweet me, at Sir Josh Bennett, and we can talk more. Because <laughs> I need good book designers in my life, for sure. Another question from Twitter. How has your, under, your undergraduate degree in theater impacted mm. your writing and reading of poetry? Yeah, yeah. So I did my master's in theater and performance at the University of Warwick, which was incredible. I mean, in no small part, because it was my introduction to graduate school, right, um, before I did the PhD at Princeton, and I'm thankful for that. Because in the UK, in this theater and performance program, people were performing their dissertations and their theses. So one of my colleagues had like a one-man show as Prince, as his dissertation. I was like, what does that even mean? <laughs> it's like in character as Prince this whole time. <laughs> like he's walking around, he's doing the show. And it, it struck me that it could be whatever we wanted, right? And that had simply not occurred to me before, in part because of my trauma tied to oceanography, right? My undergraduate education could not be whatever I wanted. I had to take specific classes, or they said, you cannot give the graduation speech, right? If you don't pass oceanography in this uh, random math class, I also had to take. So for me, um, yeah, it changed my life to have that year in the UK period because I also didn't have a passport, right? This is something else about class. Before I won the Marshall Scholarship, right? I had to win this prestigious award that sends 32 Americans abroad to have a passport and start to travel. And once I started, I never stopped. So after the, the UK, it was South Africa, it was moving through the Caribbean, it was coming to understand myself as, um, as a person in the world, right? As a global citizen. Um, and so that part of the program really changed my life too that I was completely responsible for my own time. There was no coursework um, in the UK grad system, so I just had to think, read, write, and hand it in. I couldn't believe it. I was like, who's gonna make me do it? Am I gonna get in trouble? They were like, yeah, you won't get a degree, but <laughs> it's up to you. Um, and that responsibility, I think it helped make me an adult, to be honest. It made me a better writer. Uh, it definitely made me a better teacher. Have you made an auditory recording of your books? If not, mm. could you please do that? <laughs> I'm on it. That's a great idea. <laughs> I got you. Are you as hopeful as your father, as future-oriented? Mm. <sighs> I aspire toward it. You know, because I think part of it for my dad is just what he survived, right? Like he got a Purple Heart. He was in Vietnam. You know, he, um, he enlisted because his little brother enlisted. And the recruiter told them that they wouldn't take two sons from the same family. And of course, they, they did, right? And then when he got home, you know, he met my mom and, you know, I sprouted out of the ground, right? It's um, my father has seen so much that I think it's, when he wakes up in the morning, I imagine just like, oh, still here, like, let's go, you know? <laughs> I'm doing this again, this thing that I never thought I'd be doing. I've survived a war, I survived segregation and integration, I survived raising, you know, six children, <laughs> you know, in New York, it's a wild place. And so I do think I inherit some of his hope largely because of my students, though, you know? I've had a relatively guarded life in comparison to, to him, you know, but my students make me immensely hopeful. All of them, not just my students at Dartmouth, but I, I travel quite a bit, so I've been touring since I was 19 years old, um, and quite a bit of my touring is with elementary school students, uh, middle school students, and high school students. So I'm doing poems with nine-year-olds, um, and I'm doing poems with high school seniors, you know, who want to talk about SATs and stuff like that uh, during Q&A. And seeing them, I take the same position that James Baldwin takes, right? It's like, who will tell the children there is no hope, you know? They reorient me towards hope every single day. So I believe in the future because I have a niece and nephew and because I believe in us. I believe in our collective capacity to change things and make things different. I'm the product of that truth, right? 
My grandmother had a second grade education when she came to the North and started three salons that she owned in Harlem. And that's why I love words, because the women in the salon would pay me a dollar for any word I could spell longer than two syllables, right? <laughs> so I learned loquacious and recalcitrant, you know, myopic. And I would go in there, you know, and I would, so that's where the dictionary comes in from that other question. Right? I used to study the dictionary as a boy, and, and I made bank. It was fantastic, you know? So as long as people are creating spaces like that, right, I have hope, of course. Because I believe, you know, that another world is possible and also that it's on its way. You, you mentioned nine-year-olds. A uh, teacher in the audience asks, how do you get kids excited about poetry? Mm. Do you start with examples from literature or do you jump into writing? Yeah. So it depends. Usually, I just show it to them. You know, YouTube is a gift in that way. It's terrifying in other ways. But there's a ton of poetry reading on the internet that kids just seem to absorb. Like the energy, this is the other thing about spoken word versus when you give a young person a poem on the page sometimes. They feel like the performer's talking to them, right? They can pull things from the story, from their facial expressions. They ask questions about, well, where was this? Where did this happen? Is this a true story? He has a big sister, I have a big sister, her name's Barbara, right? I mean, there are just different things that they draw from seeing performance. So that's where I usually start. Um, or I have them start with writing, right? I'll have them make a list. Five things you are, five things you are not. Circle one of the things you are not and write a self-portrait from that perspective. And they'll write incredible things. Self-portrait as a colored pencil. Self-portrait as the last pineapple on the tree. Or, you know, it's just like these beautiful poems about elephants and staircases just start flying across the room. Um, and that's what taught me how to teach you know, was introducing very young people to writing. Because if you can hold a nine-year-old's attention, you could do anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, from Twitter, how do you pull together all, your back, all of your background and settings in your poems mm. from a fellow compatriot of the Bronx and Yonkers? Hey, wow, both? Okay, that's amazing. <laughs> how do I pull them together? I guess I try to remind myself every time I step on a page that I have an ethical demand upon my life, to be honest. So I just try to let it all flow together, right? I try to say that no matter what, no matter how this audience receives what I'm about to say, I owe it to them and I owe it to myself to come with the, the full portrait of who I am, right? That way, if it's accepted, if it's rejected, it's on my own terms, right? And I know I didn't come with a lie. And so I just try to also believe that nothing about me is shameful. I think that's hard to believe. That's something I had to teach myself. Thank you. It's a hard lesson for us all to learn, right? But once you can shed that, right? Say, I'm ashamed of nothing. I bring it all and you can't hurt me with any of it, you know? That opened my life. Um, and so that's how I try to pull it together you know, with love and without shame. Let me pick up on that response. What is your biggest struggle and your biggest joy? Ooh, what is my biggest joy? Dance solos in my living room <laughs> when no one is around. That's the, yeah, that's the thing no one told me about having a day job. When you get off of work, it's special, man. Like, and you go home, like that first moment you close your door and just sort of like, you know, you throw on some Stephanie Mills or something, like just some good, like disco or soul and you just dance it out, that's special. So that's my greatest joy. My greatest fear was the first part of the question. Struggle. Struggle, okay, yeah, that's better because we don't want to go to fear right away. My greatest <laughs> struggle. <laughs> I guess to, and this is a, a good struggle, I guess, in many ways, to balance all that I love, you know? To balance teaching with writing, with traveling, with lecturing, having things like this, with trying to be a good son 
and uncle and godfather, you know, to my two goddaughters who live in different parts of the country, um, balancing all of that. And the American Academy, so much of it is just being a smart person all the time, right? It's just performing <laughs> smartness. So do you know how smart I am? Listen to these books. I can rail off in rapid succession that no one's heard of, and that's the point, right? I mean, it's constantly, <laughs> it's constantly that, you know? And it takes a lot of work to be able to do that. So, you know, shout out to all my f fellow, you know, formerly traumatized graduate students, but it's like, it's tough to balance that pressure with the kind of pedagogy I've described already, which is that I wanna make meaning with my students and talk about the human condition, and I wanna be a decent human being who does more good than harm and who loves people um, in a way that maybe costs me something, you know? And so trying to balance all that is my biggest struggle. And to sometimes say, you know what, Josh? Go play PlayStation 4 and take a nap. You know, like, it's fine. <laughs> the world is out there, and there are literally hundreds of other people trying to do the good work, and they are. Um, so it's never just on you. You know, we strive together. We, we, we have a, uh, two questions here about uh, code switching, Ooh, which okay. you mentioned and which was uh, talked about in our lecture on Wednesday. Yeah. Questions are, do you find that you regularly code switch hmm. when interacting with different groups? Oh, and, do, and same question, do you um, ha use different speech in different circumstances? Hmm. Not really, to be honest. I sound like this all the time. <laughs> um, just always talk like this and I think I was just raised by people that told me that I would have a bunch of different Englishes right so for me it's not code switching it's not strategic it's like I have a black vernacular English in my head I have New York slang in my head I have um, a sort of more standardized uh, elite private school English I have academies right I have various kinds of theoretical jargon that I can call upon, but I don't, I don't really ever get in front of an audience and say, okay, it's time to switch into this Josh, you know? Um, I can't do that. That would feel like too much of a cage, to be honest. And I understand folks that, that do and feel that need, you know? But I just, I can't think about it like that. It's I have all this language available to me, I'll pull from it, from that well, you know, in whatever ways I can and whatever ways feel good and true, but no, too many people I think fought for my right to be fully myself wherever I am, you know? So that's how I try to show up um, in every single space. I, understanding that spoken word and rap are not synonyms, do yeah. you think they are connected? If so, how? Oh, 100%, absolutely. I mean, even to the extent that a fair number of contemporary hip hop artists have been on programs like Deaf Poetry Jam, right? <laughs> like Kanye was on Deaf Poetry recently, um, but also some young up and coming hip hop artists like Mick Jenkins. I saw him at a academic conference at Princeton and he told me he used to watch my videos when he was a teenage boy um, and was himself an aspiring spoken word poet, right? So I think there are all these intimate connections the internet makes possible. Um, but even historically, I mean, I think hip hop and spoken word are both just um, part of a much larger tradition of oral poetry. I think hip hop is poetry. It's the most popular poetry in the world. It's best understood that way. Um, and so though they're not synonymous, I think they're, uh, they're play cousins, you know? Um, they don't necessarily have a, a blood tie, but when they see each other, it's always a beautiful occasion, so. Also from Twitter, how can we read poetry so that we fee so that we fee through, excuse me how can we okay. read poetry so that we feel it when we hear so it's like when we hear poetry or will it always be different? Oh, wow 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 wow! So it's like how do you capture the power of performance while you're reading? Yeah, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I, I would. I would <laughs> I'd definitely say best of luck with that project. I mean, you just might need to read it out loud. I don't know, or have your friend read it. Maybe that's the best way. But I think the voice you're hearing in your head when you read is the closest you're gonna get. I mean, there are different practices, but 
if this person figures it out, please also feel free to tweet me, because um, <laughs> I'd love to hear <laughs> how it goes. Do you remember now your four-year-old sermons, and would you like to share? <laughs> oh my God. I wish, I mean, I do have my four-year-old poems because my mother kept them in a shoebox, apparently. Um, <laughs> but not the sermons. I mean, it's the weird, beautiful thing about mm -hmm. improvisation, right? I literally was making these things, I can't fathom that now. I was making these things up on the spot for 30 to 40 minutes on a weekly basis. My family were just like, listen, like, oh yes, mm, that's brilliant. It's a brilliant reading of the book of Habakkuk, right? It's just like, <laughs> what is happening? Um, but I think it was, they were just trying to teach me that I had value, you know? And then my voice, carried and could change things. Um, and also that church wasn't just about sitting still and listening to someone else, but that you were supposed to take that sort of stuff home. You know, not just the spiritual lessons, but the practices themselves, you know? Um, and I thought I was gonna be a preacher for a long time, you know? Um, and then I think this maybe started to feel like a kind of ministry I could give my life to, so. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us a little bit about your book, Spoken Word, A Cultural History. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all for listening, by the way. And thank you, Jeff, for being a great questioner. Um, yeah, the book is a 50-year history from 1969 to 2019, tracing basically the genesis of spoken word poetry in the United States, um, the spoken word poetry movement, as I'm imagining it, which uh, in the story I'm telling which is a book of rooms is how I'm defining it. So I'm starting with the Black Arts Repertory Theater and School in Harlem, uh, which is a school that only existed for one year. Uh, it was surveyed by the FBI. Um, and if you look at the FBI files, it's fascinating. They just go in there and they say, you know, this actually isn't a hotbed of communism. It's just kids reading poems. So <laughs> we're gonna leave now. And then that's it, you know? It <laughs> like falls apart because of funding, but I mean that, that kind of archival work is so fascinating when you're working on something like this. Another chapter uh, is about Nikki Giovanni and this beautiful album she releases in 1971 called Truth Is On Its Way. And she records the album with the New York Community Choir. So every single song is one of her spoken word performances and a gospel choir singing a hymn behind it. And she said that she wrote that album for her grandmother. Right? She said the older generation has a sense that the radical poets hate them, and that is not the case, and this album is here to prove that. Right? She sold 100,000 copies of a poetry album in 1971. She packed out an auditorium to hear it. Hey, and I love dogs. Um, and that moment to me captures the movement as a whole. Right? completely challenges the way we think about radical youth movements, you know, radical poets. It's like, no, this is actually about the elders. It's about every generation of us and bringing them together. It's about camaraderie and not just competition. So that's really what I'm trying to argue in my book is that these small collectives of poets throughout this 50 year history, not only shape the sound of spoken word, but I think give us a more optimistic vision of what we can be, right? As writers, as community members, as human beings. We have uh, many requests here for one more. One for more one poem. More poem. Okay. And I, before, before you do that, yeah, yeah. you don't know what a compliment it is that at this hour of the day that there are still this many people in this amphitheater. Yeah, I'm like, how is everyone still, still here? Chautauquans have a tendency to need to get to the next thing, but yeah. this is the next thing, I believe. Yeah, thank you all for being amazing. You know what? I'm going to read a poem about the barber shop. Because <laughs> my barber is like one of my favorite people. His name is Eli. Hi, Eli, if you're out there. I know you're out there. You're in New York right now. Okay, this is Barber's song. And this is a, really a poem about uh, gentleness and how the barber shop is the first place that I learned how important it was to be gentle. Barber song. Postmodern blackness blacksmith, 
Straight razor reshaping self-esteem. You dream in geometry unreachable by any other means. Speak in entire phrases abandon standard American etymology. Hence, you liberate waves from the sea, cornrows from the cornfield. Reclaim fade so I now hear the word and imagine only abundance. Caesar never meant anything to me but a cut so close you could see the shimmer of a man's thinking. You are how we first learned to bend language built to unmake us, accept implausible risk, some much older man, shaver in hand like a baton full of wasp gossip, asking with the grain or against. And the question feels damn near existential, given this is the only place we can live in such thoughtless proximity to another person's open hands, be held by the face, ask outright to be made glamorous, shaped by your polymathic brilliance, you bi-weekly psychoanalyst, first stop before funeral, before wedding and block party alike, you soothsayer, cooing children to calm as they sit in the chair for the first time, as still a storm as one might reasonably expect, you ethicist, defending hairlines at all cost. <laughs> Your vigilance, keeping online and otherwise slander at bay. Philosopher King, thesaurus in the drawer, dominoes and scotch and barbasol adorning your countertop, right above the chorus line of clippers swaying to the clamor of checkmates and offhand insults now filling the shop, each moving as if the unfettered locks of some great metal monster, some faraway watcher, and you, guardian of it all, clean as a pope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.